the Rover 2000 is one of the most interesting cars you can possibly go and look at. And one of the most fun things you can get in and drive. What? A Rover? Fun? Exciting? Yeah. <laughs> Up until the 1960s, Rover had a well-deserved reputation for building very solid but maybe a little bit boring cars. Then in 1963, along came this, and everything changed. When the covers came off this car at the Earls Court Motor Show, you could hear respectable gentlemen's pipes hitting the floor across the country. They didn't know what to make of David Backle, Batch or Bach's design. It was like nothing else on the British market. Everything else suddenly looked 20 years old in comparison. It was a revelation, and especially from a staid company like Rover. What they did was create the executive compact car market that BMW dominated today. At the time, Rover was an independent company with a team of young, excited designers who wanted to build the best car they possibly could. They took their styling cues from America, their engineering cues from all over the world. This car has an almost unique base unit construction. The only other car I can think of made the same way is the Citroen DS, which is even more crazy than this. The whole base of the car is a frame, and every panel just hangs off it cosmetically. The idea was, every couple of years, they could design completely new bodywork and make a whole new car. It never happened, because they couldn't keep up with production, even as it was. So all we got was some side stripes and a different grille in the end. But the idea was there. They put an aluminium bonnet and boot on the car, and little tiny pips on the side lights so you could see exactly where you're going and make it easy to park. They stole styling cues from America and added fins. Well, little fins, because it is Britain after all. Borrowing from the E-Type Jaguar, this car has got inboard brake discs at the back. That means the brakes are mounted up by the differential to reduce unsprung weight, meaning the handles better. It does, however, mean that they're an absolute nightmare to service. Something this car did a long time before it was fashionable and before Volvo and Saab got in on the act was safety. Ralph Nader, the man who almost single-handedly killed the Corvair in America, called this the safest car in the world. Why? Well, a number of reasons. First off, it had disc brakes all round as standard, every car got that. It's one of the first cars to have crumple zones built into the, the chassis. So if you hit something, it takes up the impact. It's got soft padded bins, so if you crash your knees into the dashboard in an accident, it doesn't kill you. It is one of the first cars to have seatbelts as standard and then an inertia reel seatbelt as standard. It has mounting points in the rear for back seatbelts as standard. The fuel tank is behind the back seat, so if there's a crash, it won't get hit and it won't split. But the engineers on this car went crazy. They had all kinds of mad ideas, and they just ran with it. The accountants would have killed it long ago on today's cars, but the front suspension is unlike anything you'll see on any car ever again. The spring is horizontal, the shock absorber is at 45 degrees, and everything else just kind of pivots madly around it, and there was a reason for that, and that's because they wanted to put a jet turbine in this car, and they nearly did it as well. Two prototypes exist, and they do still run if you're brave enough. This engine bay is massive. The idea was they were going to put a jet engine in here because it was the 60s and people were up for any kind of crazy technological idea like that. Rover have been building jet engines since the Second World War. They were heavily involved in it. Unfortunately, they had to hand over their research to Rolls-Royce who are still doing jet engines today. Um, but this did mean that they designed this car with a really, really wide engine bay. But at first, all they put in was an all new four cylinder, two litre engine, which makes about 99 horsepower as standard compared to the Triumph 2000, which was the main competitor for this, it's not really as smooth or powerful, but it's a good engine. They're tough as old boots and they're you know, reliable and get you up the road pretty quickly. And that is something else this car was designed for. The new motorways had just opened four years before this car came out. And at that time, there was no speed limit. This car's design brief was to do 100 miles an hour up the length of the M1 with four passengers and their luggage in the boot, and it did it. This I'm leaning on right here, quite painfully, is another of the car's shortcomings. There aren't many shortcomings on this car, but the fact that the fuse box in the glove box tends to melt and catch fire is one of them. So this car has now got relays for the headlights and uprated headlights. This interior really is pure 1960s. The spindly steering wheel, the open dashboard and thin A-pillars, all screams out 1960s America, but the wood, well the fake wood, the leather is very, very English. This car has an amazing slick four-speed gearbox. 
The auto is okay, but really, it's kind of dull. I love this little map light. In fact, everyone who gets in this car loves this little map light. Delay wipers, how many cars had this in the 60s? Two gallon petrol reserve, not a common feature on many cars, but I can tell you when I had this car when I was a teenager, I used this thing like a payday loan every single week. That pulled out and got me an extra 60 miles somewhere closer to a petrol station. I don't know if it was amazing foresight or just lucky coincidence, but the radio that was fitted as an option in these cars was a single din size. So today you can still fit a modern radio. These seats have been reupholstered and repanded. Quarter lights. Quarter lights are the greatest invention ever. You cars should have them as well, they're fantastic. A bit loud on the microphone, I expect. This car could do 0 to 60 in about 12 seconds, which doesn't sound like a lot today, but in the early 60s, that was astronomical. That was a Saturn rocket going to the moon. And when they stuck to the 80, that would do 0 to 60 in 8 seconds. That's still faster than Mondeo diesel. Luckily, Rove designed the front suspension so the engine bay could be really wide for the jet turbine. This did mean, very luckily indeed, that it was wide enough to take the V8 a bit later on. However, it does mean it's got this mad front suspension setup with bits going all over the place. And that has the effect that it's a lovely, lovely soft ride, um, but does grip very well indeed. At the back, it has a De Dion tube set up. And what that means is that it's got two axles effectively. You've got the differential and the half shafts, and then you've got a sliding spline tube that works against itself and keeps the rear wheels always completely vertical. And that means no matter how hard you corner, the back tyres are always in full contact with the road. This is why when they've stuck the V8 in, police forces lapped them up. It was one of the only things that could keep up with the stolen Mark II Jags of the era. Now, power steering was not standard on four cylinders. It was optional on V8s, and I can't remember if the four box got it as an option even. But once you're rolling, it's fine. It's a really good system. The idle box is over there somewhere in the engine bay, which means that it's not a direct spike through your chest if you have a front end collision. But it's also nice and tight. I just had to spend a bit of money getting this idler box replaced because that was worn out and a bit slack. It's geared a little bit on the low side, but high enough that you can throw it into a corner and the wheels go exactly what you want it to. And the car stays going in the right direction. Those four wheel disc brakes on all, all corners, well, the two corners in the front, the middle and the back. This car stops like nothing else. Hang on to your hats, kids. Yeah, I've got tyre smoke on that. So, why is this the best car in the world? Well, it handles in its own unique way. It's really safe. It's pretty fast. And, let's face it, it looks good. This car looked great. And look at this interior. Come on. There is nothing not to love on this car. Okay, there are three things not to love on this car. The boot's a little bit on the small side. The engine is a little bit rough sounding sometimes. And if we're being really honest here, the fuse box catches fire. So, okay, three little things. And they're, yeah, you can live with that kind of stuff, I guess. This car is actually pretty luxury. The ride is just, oh, sublime. It's not like a modern car or really, the equivalent cars of the day aren't really quite the same. It's somewhere between a sports car and a Rolls Royce. Yeah, that's not really helpful, is it? I've just spent a silly amount of money having the, um, the door shelves welded on this car because it's getting rotten in the back. And was that a sensible thing to do? Yeah, I reckon it was because this car is fantastic and I want to keep on driving this forever. I can't imagine a time when I wouldn't want to get this car. Just drive it. This is my feel good place because you get in this car and everything is right with the world. And I don't mean you're taking back to a different time in the 1960s when life was better because I'm pretty sure it wasn't. But this car, this car melts your troubles away just by being awesome. Okay, it's not most of my troubles right now because I'm stuck behind a truck 
now there's a dumper truck behind me. This is actually slightly annoying. Well, thank you for watching this and I hope you've enjoyed it. Please hit subscribe, please hit like, and please watch the next one. And if there's a car you'd like me to go and try and find out some facts about, take for a drive, let me know in the comments underneath.